Hello, I'm Eric Corman, Communications Director at League of Education Voters and parent of a sixth grader of color in the public school system who is accessing special education services. This webinar features closed captions. To access the captions, just click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. Spanish interpretation is also available. To access this webinar in Spanish, in your webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, click interpretation, which is the icon that looks like a globe, then click Spanish. And if you want to hear only Spanish without the original English in the background, click mute original audio. Special thanks to Claudia Azar, who is our interpreter. If you have any technical issues, feel free to use the chat function, which I will monitor throughout the webinar. In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education Voters is a statewide nonprofit working with families, educators, and leaders to build a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. We believe that education is a tool for justice. One of the systems that perpetuate racial injustice experienced by communities of color is our schools. We believe every child deserves an excellent public education that provides an equal opportunity for success. In order to achieve this, we must pursue radical change in our school systems for equity, justice, and liberation. We must build schools and systems that honor the humanity of every student. Welcome to our free online webinar series, Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series seven years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. Today's webinar features Washington State Teachers of the Year on reimagining education after COVID. We are honored to have Washington State Teachers of the Year, Brooke Brown from 2021, Amy Campbell from 2020, Robert Hand from 2019, Mandy Manning, 2018, and the 2018 National Teacher of the Year, Camille Jones, 2017, and she'll be joining us by a video recording, Nate Bowling from 2016, who'll also be on video recording, and Lion Terry from 2015 with us. As we enter the final quarter of this historic and challenging school year, students, families, and educators across Washington are navigating remote, hybrid, and modified in-person learning environments. But what should education look like when all schools reopen? In this webinar, the Washington State Teachers of the Year will share what they are hearing from students, families, and colleagues in their community on how the 2020-2021 school year is going, how they recommend reimagining education based on what they have learned from teaching during the COVID pandemic, and will answer your questions. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This is a space for you to submit questions to us. We'll have about 10 minutes for questions after the panel discussion wraps up. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the webinar quality to us on the chat function or at info at educationvoters.org. And speaking of the chat function, you're welcome to use it to check in and comment on anything you hear. Welcome Washington State Teacher of the Year from 2021, Brooke Brown from the Franklin Pierce School District. 2020 Washington State Teacher of the Year, Amy Campbell from the Camas School District. 2019 Washington State Teacher of the Year, Robert Hand from the Mount Vernon School District. 2018 Washington State Teacher of the Year and 2018 National Teacher of the Year, Mandy Manning, now with the Washington Education Association. 2017 Washington State Teacher of the Year, Camille Jones from the Quincy School District. 2016 Washington State Teacher of the Year, Nate Bowling, now teaching abroad in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And 2015 Washington State Teacher of the Year, Lion Terry, now an assistant principal at Highline Public Schools. We're gonna ask two questions during this webinar for the panel, which is, what are you hearing from students, families, and colleagues in your community on how the year is going? And based on what you've learned from teaching during the COVID pandemic, how would you recommend reimagining education? So I'm gonna start with the first question. What are you hearing from your colleagues and the communities? And I'll just go ahead and call on Amy because I can. <laughs> Amy, if you could start us off, that would be great. And anyone feel free to just jump on in. Oh, if you look too engaged, you might get called on. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here today. And I'm so excited to be joined by my fellow teachers of the year. And I'm excited to hear what you guys are hearing. Um, it's been a really interesting year. 
I, in the Camas School District, we started our, I think every district in Washington did something slightly different. And I think that's the first thing that I've heard a lot from people is just um, how it, it's hard on a number of levels. It's hard to be remote, right? It's hard to be transitioning and it's hard to see different things happening across settings. That's um, having local autonomy is really powerful, being able to leverage the assets of a community, like use what a community has to help them be successful and build the best, most appropriate system within that setting. But I think it's very confusing as we look and even pre this, this webinar, we're checking in every time I see another teacher now, the first question we ask is, hey, are you in person? We don't ask if school's in because we're all teaching all the time, right? Um, there's no school in or out. We're just, are you, are you in person or are you remote? And, and so I think I hear a lot of confusion uh, and that can be so unsettling. Um, the, and uncertainty. The, we, the words we keep throwing around, um, but they really do paint a picture of, of what we're hearing. And that can be very stressful, I think, for students and for families and for educators, that sense of uncertainty as, we, as we're trying to build something right now that's going to be successful and serve our students. And as we look forward, Right, we, um, I'm excited to be having this conversation about things that, that are working right now that we want to carry on with, things that have, don't serve us well now and maybe didn't serve us in the past, what are we gonna get rid of? But not knowing what all of that is, I think um, it's unsettling to people. So I'm glad we're having this conversation early so anyone who's participating can gather some of these ideas and take back to their uncertain school districts and school boards some of these really neat ideas maybe for rebuilding and learning forward. Great, thank you so much, Amy. And teachers, I'll be watching to see which one of you unmutes, so that way I'll know that you're ready to go also. That's, that's another way. But in the meantime, um, Robert, what have you been hearing from your communities and colleagues? Yeah, uh, thank you for, uh, for having us here uh, to begin with. Um, I'm, I'm hearing a lot. Uh, but one of the things that, that uh, I think I've heard a lot in, in communities, I mean, across the country that people have talked about is the idea of, of where are we going to be at when we return? Where are kids going to be at when they return? People are worried about learning loss and, and about, uh, you know, the things that, that we'll have to adapt to when we come back and how things will be different. And um, what, what I, I mean, it's really easy if you look at anything in life to, to look at the negative and to look at what you've lost and, and, and the things that have been sacrificed over time and everything. But like, what about what we, what we've learned and what we've gained? Like, why don't we, why don't we look at that? And why don't we look at when we come back, um, rather than like, what, what have we lost? And let's look at all the negatives. Like, let's look at what we've learned and, and how we can come back and reimagine what we're coming back to. Um, and so that's one of the things I like to, to really try to, to, uh, to, to think about myself when I'm, when I'm coming back. Um, what are the things that, that, that I've learned over this time that I didn't do before? Um, what are the things that I'm going to come back ready to, to embrace and, and to, to use to help me be a better uh, classroom teacher, a better colleague, a better uh, support for all the people that I'm with? And like kids are, are, are so resilient. They've shown us over this, this time. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a really difficult thing. I have a daughter my, myself that's in uh, eighth grade, um, navigating middle school and, and trying to, to go through all the complexities of that and doing it in a remote environment here. She's been here at home learning for the last year. I've been here at home teaching for the last year. It's been rough um, on all of us in so many different ways. Um, but if you think about the, uh, the, the toughness that, that our kids have shown, the, the, the resilience that they've, they've exhibited and, and how they've, they've shown up and, and we've, we've changed things so many times on them and they show up anyways uh, and they figure it out. They ask the tough questions. And that's one of the things I think that's been my favorite is just the, the kids uh, showing us how good they are at adapting um, to change because what else are they gonna do, right? And so um, I'm really excited about uh, continuing to come back, I had a conversation yesterday uh, with colleagues and we were talking about what are some of the things that you're gonna um, bring with you and continue doing that you've learned how to do over this time. And people were talking about being tired of, 
Zoom and being tired of, of Pear Deck and all these tools that we've used. And I said, yeah, like I, I, I understand that. But I, I think if we if we look at it as a way to, to embrace some new tools to allow student voice to come in that wasn't there before, like I was talking about using um, Pear Decks when I come back into the classroom. Pear Deck, uh, for those that aren't familiar, is kind of an embedded tool in like a Google Slides presentation, for instance, where students can interact with you while you're presenting information. You can really easily put a little prompt up that they can respond to and you can see it on screen. And, and the, the amount of conversation and ideas that I've heard from students um, that I wouldn't have heard otherwise without that, um, because it's a tool that like I've embraced using in this remote environment, um, has made me think like, how cool is that gonna be when I'm back in the classroom and I can like turn a Pear Deck on and have kids be able to, to like send responses in. And I'm gonna get all these responses where before it's like, hey, who wants to answer this question? And you know, you get those couple that are always like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll answer it. And I'm like, man, I know there's so many good ideas out there. And for, for a variety of good reasons, kids maybe not, you know, ready to share it, but it, they'll, they'll share it on the Pear Deck, I'll read it and they can give me prompts to say like, hey, um, you know, it's okay for, for you to share this idea when it's time to share. Uh, it's okay to call on me to share this idea when it's time to share. And I'm, I'm just so excited about things like that. Like, I'm not worried about the things that we may have lost over the last year. Um, we, we all know that we've lost things over the last year. But rather than focus on that, let's look at the things that we've gained and the things that we can come back to to continue to reimagine and improve uh, what we're doing in schools. That, that's what I'm excited about. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Robert. Lion, I saw you unmuted for a minute. Did you have something that you'd like to jump in with? Well, you know, Robert, we hit on so many important things, but I, you know, first of all, like the, the whole learning loss thing is amazing to me, you know, that people even focus on that at all, because I'll tell you, like I visit fourth graders, fourth grade classes, and the teacher says, oh, I'm going to drop this link in the to make a copy and then download pictures of your work into the slide deck and then share it with me and then share it with the assistant principal. And everybody does it, right? That's an incredible amount of learning that our, my fourth graders have done to be able to like do all of that technology stuff. And I just think, you know, our, an opportunity has really opened up for us at this point for multiple modes of learning and multiple modes of teaching that we have maybe have been forced to, but I think kids are really responding to. Like we have some really, you know, I've seen some kids who are very, uh, you know, kind of into themselves, if you will, not very outgoing and and they love the chat function and they love things like Pear Deck and Jamboard. And, you know, they're, they're really rocking some of those things. And to me, that is like an eye opener for us. And I think families and students are saying, okay, we need to keep this aspect of, of learning and teaching about, you know, uh, different modes of, of responding and different modes of you know, learning that is not just, you know, sage on the stage because, you know, we don't have all the answers and our students have a lot of them. So, I think, you know, I'm definitely taking away some of that. I think my families are as well. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going to, uh, oh, Mandy, I saw you uh, unmuted. And after that, I'll go ahead and share a clip from uh, Nate Bowling from Abu Dhabi. And then Brooke, I'll, I'll go to you after that. So go ahead, Mandy. I just wanted to add, because I uh, echo what everybody else has already said, uh, but I just had a conversation with an educator um, on Friday. And she and I were talking extensively about how before, before we went remote, um, we, were, we did a lot of like rule following in schools, right? So as long as kids understood how school worked and what was expected and they had the directions, they could do it. But we didn't really build the executive function very well. And what we're seeing now is, is a lot of learning on executive functions. So kids are scheduling themselves. They're keeping track of their own learning. They're learning skills to be able to bring those into the classroom once everybody is face to face. And then just one more, so executive, I can't say enough about executive function because it's something that's so important as people grow in, into adulthood um, and something that we don't usually very intentionally talk about. Um, and so I think that that's an important takeaway from this year. Um, and then also the frustration that educators have felt because so many people keep talking about this learning loss and this, this deficit mindset um, and suggesting that educators just don't wanna work as hard when in reality, educators are working twice as hard because they're having to learn platforms and pr provide education. And now things change so rapidly depending on the district. Um, and so they're having to adjust at a moment's notice, whether it's to full remote as it was previously to some sort of a hybrid where they're not only 
teaching face to face, but also remotely. Um, and so there's just countless hours are being um, committed to the education of young minds and um, dedication to all of, of, of um, our students and our families and our communities here in the state. Um, and I also just want to point out that <sighs> formats are different across the state. And so we've had communities that have been face to face the entire time, um, except for in the spring, because I, there was a mandate that all schools were to uh, not be face to face. But there are, there are um, um, communities that have been face to face since you know the start of the school year. There have been communities that have been hybrid since the start of the school year. There have been communities that have been full remote since the start of the school year. And so um, we try to put a blanket expectation on every single community, but every single community needs something different. But the thing that has been consistent throughout this entire year has been two things. One, kids are awesome. And two, educators are extremely dedicated to their kids and to their communities and have bent over backwards to ensure that kids are getting what they need. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now and we'll hear from Nate Bowling. Actually, let me make sure that the video is enabled real quick. So let me do that. We'll share sound and optimize. There we go. In my context in Abu Dhabi, we're on a hybrid schedule. Where we're on campus two days a week and then off campus two days a week. And so my students basically are still kind of getting a half online experience and half remote experience. And what I hear from students is that like, it feels good to be back on campus, but at the same time, there's a lot of merit to things that they've done and experienced in online school. And uh, I think a lot about my students and how they feel glad to be back on campus ever since normalcy. But at the same time, like there's things about the system they like to change. All right, and so that's what Nate's hearing. Brooke, what are you hearing from colleagues and communities? Yeah, I would say yes to everything that everyone said before me. <laughs> and I would also say that, um, you know, it's just, it's deeply personal. I think this is something that we've really learned and has really been demonstrated is that school, how it's been uh, for, you know, the past uh, is, does not work for every student. And I think that has been made very clear um, during this pandemic of students learning remotely. And then um, like in our district, we're using a high flex model. So teachers are being asked to teach in person and to students at home at the same time simultaneously. And so um, like that's magic. Like I don't even like that they are, uh, teachers are magic, they're magicians doing incredible work. And so I think what, one thing that has really resonated with me and, and um, I would say yes, what Amy was saying about, you know, just uncertainty and, and things changing all the time. Yes, to how Robert was saying about positivity and seeing the things that we can take with us and, and how Mandy was sharing that, um, you know, every community needs something different. And I would even make that go further and say every student really need something different. And so I think if there's anything that we've really learned is if we truly believe that there's no throwaway children, which I, none of us, believe that. Um, and if we truly believe that every student deserves to have access to um, education and opportunities, and we're really going to remove barriers and, and help students really be successful, then we can't continue doing things the way that we've been doing. And so I think we really need to think about, you know, for some students that learned remotely and, and that really worked for them, how are we going to continue that after the pandemic? Um, after we all return to the building because y'all we've been teaching this whole time so <laughs> when and really like what are we doing to help our our students that work um you know just different things that worked well for some students and and for others and really really kind of dialing down to what each of our students really need and and making sure that um the way that we do school um looks different and that it's it's forever changed um to really reflect what our students and our communities need, not what we think they need. And so I think that's a really big thing that um, we need to make sure that there's been a lot of reopening plans. There's been a lot of discussions that I think parents and families were not a part of. And so I think that's something that we need to really shift and make sure that the decisions and the things that we do as we return to the building in the fall um, and uh, not to school, cause we've all been doing school, but. Um, how are we making sure that, that we're utilizing 
um, the, the wisdom and the knowledge that our students and our families bring and really working with them to empower what they need because they have the answers. And so I think uh, when we have the humility to listen, then we can really have the capacity to make some really long lasting changes for, um, for our students and uh, for our communities. Yeah, yeah, and, and way to tease the, uh, the second part of our discussion about remanaging education, Brooke. I appreciate that. Lion, you wanted to jump in? Well, I just wanna just to echo what, uh, what Brooke is saying that, you know, first of all, in the Highline Public Schools, we actually are starting a virtual academy starting next year. We've already hired a principal and we have six through 12th graders. We'll have the option of staying remote, right? And, you know, we have to be able to you know, listen to our communities and say, this is what's working. I've been listening. I work in a dual language school, Title I dual language school in White Center neighborhoods, south of Seattle. And I'll tell you, a lot of my students of color are really loving the online learning thing because they get to they get to learn in a way that is actually where they don't feel kind of personally attacked all the time and, and are not feeling like all of the microaggressions that school often you know places on them they're not necessarily feeling them all the time they're telling me that this is working really well for me i don't have to turn on my screen i don't get picked on or i i don't you know all the little things that happen in schools all the rules that mandy was talking about earlier right we have to like think about what it's going to look like next because when i listen to them they're telling me yeah this is hard but there's some aspects of it they really like and you know i think we need to be able to respond to them and you know think about what are those things what are those rules and those ways of being that we have at school that we just get to change now based on what our parents are telling us yeah yeah absolutely i'm going to share uh, what camille jones the 2017 teacher of the year from quincy had to say on what she's hearing from her community this school year has been unique in you know every way as we all experience for me this is my first year i've been out of the classroom i'm our district's instructional technology coach so I've been planning and supporting a lot of the training and ongoing needs for families and students and teachers with technology, um, as well as facilitating a lot of the surveys and interviews and things we've done to gather feedback from our different stakeholders this year. So I have gotten to hear a lot from a lot of different people. And you know, right now at this point in the year, everyone's really tired, especially staff. Um, we have been transitioning throughout the year in the different models we've been in. We started fully remote and then slowly began to phase students in starting in November. Um, and that slowly evolved for half day learning, um, starting with K3, then 4-5 came in and then 6-12 as well in February. So right now we have everyone back for half day learning that wants to be, which is about 65% of our students total. Um, and the other 35% are continuing to learn full time at home. But starting at the end of April, um, we are opening for full day learning for K-5 and 98% of our families have selected to return. And so they're very excited about that. And 75% um, of our staff are very excited about that as well. So they're ready to get kids back to school. Um, at the same time, feeling apprehensive about another big change happening with only six weeks left in the school year. So we're right in the middle of all that right now. Um, our secondary um, students and staff are feeling really, really good about being back at school for the amount that they are and happy to keep that consistency through the end of the year. I had some conversations recently. One was actually with one of our principals and who, who has a secondary student herself. And she said the day after school started, she saw the light come back to her child. And it was a light she didn't even realize he was missing. She didn't realize he'd been struggling as much. And um, it was just so much better for him to be back at school. And I've heard that from parents and teachers and students all around the district that it's just so, so much better for them. Um, they're just so happy to be able to be back. And so um, it's going it's going well despite its challenges. And I think our district has, um, how do they like to say it, taken a, a like kind of a slow but constant push at keeping things moving and progressing to get kids back to school. And that's our goal. And, and I think that they've done well to move about that. And I'm excited um, to see as we keep moving forward. And right now our, our um, numbers for COVID are the lowest they've been since the pandemic started. And so we're excited that the opportunity that's bringing to keep us moving as well. All right, yeah, and that's, that's Camille and she'll have more to say later. 
So I guess that moves us to the big question, which is based on this year and your learnings from teaching or your connections with communities this year, how would you reimagine education? And Amy, I know that you had some ideas we've talked earlier, so I'm gonna call on you first again. And you've been doing some really cool things in your classroom, by the way. So I just wanna give oh. you props. Okay. <laughs> and and um, I, I really, I was excited like Brooke was to hear all the answers of what we're all hearing. Robert, I am 100%, we've been, um, we, we started, my students started, um, I serve students with moderate to profound impact from disability. And so they started in small cohorts on site. And I was teaching some students um, who were, you know, off site remotely. Then we moved to um, Brooke, I don't know what you called it, high leverage hybrid. We call it Roomin and Zoomin, where you're in your room teaching some kids and then you're Zooming with some kids. I think it's kind of a fancy way to say it. But I, um, even now, ah, oh, high flex, there you go. Roomin and Zoomin. Um, but what I realized as I was doing this, Mandy's right, it's magic. It is not just, it is, it takes a lot of focus. It takes a lot of planning. You have to be very intentional, um, but it allows you to reach a diverse like set of needs. Kids who are at home learning one way and maybe they can, I, you know, they're active, they're moving around. Um, kids who are in my classroom who can have me a little bit in person and also being able to reach families. This very strange pandemic. I think one of the things that I learned that I'm going to carry forward, and I, I think um, I hope is carried forward across a lot of settings, is the value of having these Zoom experiences where I can be in families' homes with them. And I heard so many times from parents, oh my goodness, that strategy you've told me about over and over, the way you use visuals or the way you set up this learning experience, I never knew what you were talking about, but now I see it. And so parents, um, you know, they, they're never given the guidebook. I'm not even a parent, but I don't think, I hear there's no guidebook. And so I am not a perfect teacher, but being able to have parents be in the Zoom meeting with me, sharing how they are able to get outcome, you know, support their students learning, their child's learning, and I can share how I support the student learning. That's the magic right? We're all learning from each other and we're building a huge community when we had opportunities where we were all in Zoom together um, in this very isolated space where everyone's at home, the families are at home, the kids are at home, to have kids learning from me and then have a parent's thumb come across the screen and give another, you know, kid a, a thumbs up. It's like our community is like fully seeing each other um, in a unique new way. I was excited last night to join our school board meeting. They're all in the room together finally and members from our community were there. But people who can't join the meeting in person joined remotely and they got to be part of that conversation. So I don't wanna throw away these computers once we're done with them. Um, I wanna keep this and I wanna make sure we're prioritizing internet as a utility. Um, I don't, before the pandemic, we have had students um, in our classrooms who needed to write a term paper and were sitting on a curb in front of a Starbucks using the Wi-Fi because they didn't have internet or maybe they were typing it on their phone because they didn't have a Chromebook. And March 13th happened, we started handing out devices because everybody's going to need something. Where was the recognition before that? That technology is a part of our educational system. And if everybody ha doesn't have it, not everybody's getting the same opportunity. So I think um, as, as hard as this experience, the technology was in some ways, um, I think we need to keep pressing forward because it is a part of our future. And we've seen, like Robert said, a lot of ways we can flex this and, and serve, provide a unique um, new way of learning and engaging for our children. I have more, but I wanna pass it. Keep going yeah. guys. Yeah, I'm watching your mutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> otherwise I will, I will call on somebody. All right, Brooke, go for it. 
Okay, so yes to everything Amy said. And I just wanted to kind of speak to what Lion had said just a few minutes ago about thinking about our students that um, remote learning feels better than being in the classroom due to microaggressions that they're feeling and, and not feeling um, a sense of belonging. And as a, a student of color who, who went through that at school and who often didn't feel like I belonged at school, I, that so resonates with me. And so I think, um, I know there's been some bills that have been passed really focused on cultural responsive teaching. And, and there's a lot of um, a lot of focus on sort of anti-racist practices and, and, and teaching students about anti-racist practices. And so I just really want to make sure that as we're developing um, trainings for, um, for students and, and teaching students how to be um, um, uh, teaching them social emotional learning and, and teaching them all of these things that we're also taking the time as educators to really learn for ourselves that we're taking the time to really learn about anti racist practices, and not just our certificated staff but our classified staff our administrators our school board that truly if we are really going to be in community together and one of my mentors. Uh, Vero always says how community is a verb, and so how are we continuously building that community intent intentionally over and over again. And, and so really thinking about, um, I really want every student to have different opportunities. And the reason students either have returned to school or not is very personal. But I just really want to make sure that every student feels like they have a choice, that it's not an illusion of choice, that we've we've met all of the needs that um, are necessary for students to feel like they belong at school, for parents to feel like they're welcomed at school, um, that, that we've addressed all of those things. So then if they choose remote, it's because, hey, they like um, the situation, not because the other option is not as optimal for their mental uh, and emotional health, because it's so important that our students know that they are more than what they can produce, that we are teachers of content, but more than anything, we're teachers of, of life, right? Like, it's not like they, I teach all 12th grade. So it's not like they graduate and then they're like off to the real world. Like some people think that, and I'm like, no, y'all have been living in the real world this whole time. And so what can we learn from them? And then how can we make sure that as we're thinking about what success looks like for them, that it's not what we think that we take the time to build those relationships to learn what does success look like? What do you wanna do? And how can I partner with you um, in this community of learning to help you reach your goals, to help make sure that um, there's no barriers for you to get to where you want to go. And so I, I just really think it's it's a reimagining that starts with us as educators. And I say educators as a broad term because y'all parents have been educators this year and, and for all, all of our children's lives, like parents are their first educators. So what does that look like for all of us to really truly partner together and know that our success and not just as a, as a classroom, as a school, as a community, as a state, um, it's all dependent on all of us feeling seen, all of us belonging and all of us having a vested interest in solidarity and seeing each other be successful. You know, Brooke, um uh, Bettina Love in her book talks about that as a home place. We need to create schools as home places for kids where kids are feeling loved and accepted and appreciated for who they are and what they bring rather than just like putting our, our standards and our uh, idea of what is, you know, what is the right way to be on our students. And I just think that is something we've really learned because a lot of my teachers at my school have been realizing that kids can just leave the classroom, right? If, if their education is not... Uh, culturally relevant to them, and it's not actually recognizing who they are as people, then kids can leave. And it's, it's given kids a lot more power. And I think we just need to reframe, you know, how we're connecting with families. You know, do we know our kids? Do we know their communities? Do we know their ethnicities? Do we know what matters to them? When we know those things, then we can actually teach them. And we can tailor our lessons around those things rather than around, you know, whatever, you know, me as a white guy might you know, might, you know, deem as, as the right thing for them to be or to learn or to focus on. And I just think that's one of the things going forward for me that, um, you know, we just need to get rid of a lot of our standards and, and just say, you know, what's important is our kids and who they are as people. And we need to figure out a way to love them for who they are. And, and then we can move forward and teach them whatever as soon as they know they're loved. Mm, yeah, that is so great. Mandy, go ahead. Um, 
So listening to Brooke and Amy and Lyon, um, yeah, I, I think that it's important to always start with the student first. And we don't generally do that in our education system. We, we are very much systems based. Um, and, uh, and it's all built on perpetuating a system that is, you know, white supremacist and that encourages some kids and doesn't encourage some kids and creates barriers for some and not barriers for others and all this stuff. And, and my, I love that we're talking about reimagining schools and I love that we're, you know, trying to think proactively about this because schools are often very reactive and prescriptive. So we have a way of doing things and it's very uncomfortable to move out of that kind of line of thinking. And so my, I, I'm having a lot of anxiety though about how we're moving back because it's, um, there's such a huge push to go back to in-person learning without thinking about the entire system as a whole. Um, and so my fear is that we're gonna return to in-person learning and everything's just gonna go back to how it was um, because they already try to push that onto the remote environment too, right? You have school systems that are that have maintained a very strict schedule where kids have to be online at a certain time without thinking about the access issues that are involved in that. And there's a huge resistance to actual systems change within our leaders. So the ones who are, you know, um, in charge of, of what e is even going to happen. And we can see that right now in real time with the push for standardized testing. Um, and so like we're in this entirely different system and setup and, and expectations need to be changed and standards need to be changed, but we're going to still assess everybody as if everything has been going on the same way with an assessment that doesn't generally inform classroom instruction. And so I think part of that reimagining, and this builds off of, of what Brooke was discussing concerning anti-racist training and things like that for everybody, not only the certificated staff members who are in front of the kids, but everybody, all the way from you know the um, people who are working to support um, support certificated staff members in the building, and all the way up to the people who are in charge of the superintendents, you know, and and the Department of Education, frankly. Um, and so if, if we don't start that work and do that work and help people to become more comfortable with actually, actually changing the system, not perpetuating a system that has been ineffective for so many kids for so long, and not only is it ineffective, but it actually creates barriers for them as they grow into adulthood, all of this reimagining is going to be for naught. Like I we have to have that in our heads every single step of the way, every single step of the way. And so we have to create a willingness to change and it can't be, it's too hard. It's too hard to change this. We have to create that first before we can even start thinking about um, really, really what it's gonna look like. Because if we don't strip it away, we can't rebuild. Yeah, yeah. I, I... I agree. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump to uh, Nate Bowling, his comments on reimagining. And then, Robert, I'd like to go to you after that, if that's okay. Well, it's so interesting because there's some people who are going to hear me say this and like dismiss whatever I'm saying kind of out of hand because I'm working at an international school. But one of the points that like I've really come to understand is, is that my students in the United States deserve the exact same things my students get here but we don't give them to them and that's a policy choice that we make. And so I pose this question both online and to my students and I was surprised by the, by the answers that we got. Uh, I'll start with teachers first. Uh, teachers talked about not missing things like standardized tests. Like at no point during this year where, was somebody like, you know what I really need is map data. Like that never happened this year. We did not have map data from last year and we were fine. Uh, when it comes to students, there was a lot of conversation about time. Something I think about is, is that with many of the students doing remote school, their remote school where they were at home started later than the school they're supposed to be at in person on campus. And like, that makes no sense to me. I've always thought schools are kind of weird and that's something we should address going forward. Uh, the other thing is just like the amount of rigidity and control that students kind of experience in a daily school day. 
Um, I heard a lot of students talk about how they enjoyed asynchronous learning, how they enjoyed um, having like more lo longer time horizons and, and breaks within the school day. Um, and then the other thing is that I heard a lot of students talk about how, frankly, like schools aren't a place where everybody feels safe. And there are some students who actually really enjoy the remote school experience because it made them feel safe. And I heard that in particular from some of my black and brown students back in the States. And so that gives me a lot of pause. Like I have to think about my job as a practitioner and what my role is in creating an environment where students feel safe and want to return to. Like I, I'm really passionate about the idea that like we're experiencing a once in a generation pandemic. And this is really an opportunity to reimagine schools and reimagine the things we're doing. And it would be a disservice to students and a disservice to the future and communities to basically say, oh, pandemic's almost over. Let's get back to doing the same things we were doing in the past that we know weren't working. So I wonder, Mandy, did you talk to Nate? Did Nate talk to you? <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, right on. Um, I can't agree more. Uh, Robert, uh, how would you reimagine education based on what you've learned this year? Oh, like, where, where do I even start following up everybody that just said all those amazing things? I'm just like nodding my head hard at everything that's been said so far. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, there's so much to there's so much to address. Right. So like, I'm seeing some questions in the in the Q&A and in the chat and things that um, I think are important to address and, and also following up some of the comments that I've heard so far uh, and thinking about like, yeah, how do we how do we reimagine education coming back? And the fact that we have a system that has worked for some for a long time, but has not worked for all for the entire time that it's existed. And the fact that we know that and we aren't working hard enough to make the changes that we need to. And I say we like everybody involved um, that, that has any link to education at all. Um, we're, we're not we're not moving the needle as much as we need to. And the fact that we know that we have a system that has not equitably served everybody that it's it's supposed to be serving um, is a big problem. And it's something that we have the opportunity directly in front of us to more aggressively address as we come back. I mean, we are forced into an environment right now where we have to change things. Things are already upended. Things are already uh, you know needing a massive overhaul as we come back. So why not use this as an opportunity to look at the things that we know that we need to improve and use this uh, as an opportunity to change that? I mean, if you think about like when we talk about the things that we know we need to happen, um, you know, we've known for a long time that we need more equitable access to Internet and to devices for people. And we've been asking and pushing for it. And all of a sudden this happens and somehow we find a way to make it happen because we're like, well, we don't have any other choice. Right, like we have to put the money into getting access for people. We have to put the money in because it's the only way to make sure that students have access. Well, what if what if we had that attitude about this kind of stuff all the time instead of just in the middle of a pandemic? What about if we actually said we have to do this? Like we we have students that are not receiving equitable access to education in the same way that other students are, and so we have to actually make this happen. We've seen in the middle of this pandemic that we have the ability to do that. When, when, we, when we said that we have to, well, why can't we come back and look at the fact that um, while it makes me happy to hear that students have the opportunity, um, for instance, to, to choose remote learning, right? And to say, school doesn't feel like a safe place for me because of racism and microaggressions and all of the things that are going on in this system that don't serve me equitably. So I'm gonna have remote access. And like, it, it, it warms my heart to hear that they have the opportunity to do that. And at the same time breaks it because like, how do we have a system where we know that black and brown students don't feel safe coming to our schools and would rather be remote because of that. And we don't say, well, that's something then that we have to change right now. Just like we said, we have to get devices and internet to people right now because they're not going to be educated properly without it. Well, if we know that we have students that don't feel safe coming to our schools because they're not equitably served, how, how are we not at the same time saying we have to fix that right now? Like we, we have to. There's no alternative. There's no other choice. Our schools have to be a place where we don't have nine out of 10 teachers being white, um, where we where we don't have uh, buildings that students don't feel safe coming to because of harassment and bullying and microaggressions in the classroom and and, and curriculum that doesn't reflect the, the culture that they come from. Um, we, we have to look at that as a system and say, if we are really a system that is here, that is supposed to be serving, and I don't, I don't say designed to serve because it wasn't originally designed to serve all people, but it needs to be now. 
right? It, it, it should be a system that serves all people and it's not happening. And so I don't, I don't understand how we can look at that system and say, uh, with the same passion that we said, we need devices and internet for people or else they can't come to, to school and learn. Uh, you know what, we need buildings that have more black and brown teachers in them. We need buildings that our, our students can all feel safe coming to and sitting in the room and feeling loved and welcome in the same way that all other students do that see themselves reflected at the front of the classroom, that see themselves reflected in the curriculum that we're offering. Um, and and it's, it's a process that we all have to go through, the anti-racist training, uh, the adoption of new curriculum. I mean, the fact that we have such amazing ethnic studies resources in our state, but we're not, not even necessarily offering or requiring them. I mean, we have these amazing things that are happening in our state that are available, but oftentimes are being pushed to the side and, and not embraced in the way that they should. If we know that this is something that needs to change, we need to have the same passion and aggressive pursuit of that change in order for it to happen. And I've heard people ask like, okay, how can we, how can we work with, uh, with families and all of that? That's, that's the other thing that I think that has come out of this that's been so amazing. Um, I, I've had the opportunity to connect with families. I teach uh, high school students. And um, it can be really hard to connect with families at the high school level um, because you have students that are doing sports and working and having their schedules and families that have their schedules. And, and in, the, in, the, in the past, it would mean we would have to come together in person. Well, we don't have to do that anymore. We can meet in a lot of different ways and a lot of different times. Um, and, and part of how we do that is if we look at a, a, more, a more flexible um, school system in terms of schedules and all of that. Um, you know, we have limited time together. Learning is lifelong, it has to be. But we get a very limited time when we are actually together in the building, right? So if, if we can kind of reimagine that timing a little bit, like think about Wednesdays in this system where in, in my district, we've had Wednesdays be like an async day where you can actually have some time in the middle of the week to, to catch up with things and to meet with families and to meet with students and to actually have some time and not be constantly on the grind. How, how can we fill every minute with curriculum and then give you homework to do later and all that? Like, how about if we, if we have some time built in like that where we can actually uh, do some of those things that we, we say are important but never actually have the, the time to do? Uh, I, I think there are so many opportunities in front of us where we can reimagine things in that way and we have to because we have the opportunity right now where we're coming back to a system that has been broken in a lot of ways in the past and is broken in a lot of new ways now in the present. And if we're gonna fix it, we can look at this opportunity as, as, as a way for us to address that right now and say, where are the areas that we can improve now to make sure that all students are being served equitably? Let's look at those and let's do those right now. And people are resistant to change. Right, people are resistant to change, especially now because we're so exhausted. And we're like, really, one more thing. Um, but yeah, you know, there's always going to be one more thing, right? There's always going to be something that we need to do. These are the things that we need to do right now. We need to create systems in our schools that are equitable for all of our students to come and feel safe in the building, the same way that any other student does, um, and feel like it's a welcome place for them to come and learn. That that's what we need to focus on right now. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> Yeah, well said. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Camille has an answer to this too, but I'm going to be kind of like a, a Marvel Universe movie where it, sort of in the credits, I'm going to play her remarks just because I want to make sure that we have time for Q&A. And there will be a recording of this that I will share with everyone. So if you can't stick around for Camille's comments, it will be in the recording and you get to see it then. So we've got a few minutes for questions. I just want to say thank you, Robert. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Lion, even though I know you had to catch a plane. So so that's why you're not on screen right now. Thank you, Nate, and thank you, Camille. Our first question is, after a year in isolation, being online has affected our students and how they interact with us and one another. What have you seen being done to support students emotionally and socially, especially in terms of teaching them to be culturally responsive and actively anti-racist? Go for it, Amy. You don't have to call on me. I will just quickly unmute and tell you that as everyone um, was talking, it was reminding me that uh, I think the answer of the, this question came in our last few responses of how are we providing social emotional learning, which that should have been a part of our curriculum. I was in a, a Shelley Moore, amazing Shelley Moore um, conference a 
few months ago and she was yelling, the children are the curriculum. And it stuck with me um, prior to the pandemic, was anybody talking about how we are pre prioritizing social emotional learning standards and social emotional learning in our classrooms? Not as much as they should have been. And then we went remote and now they're like, now we're hearing it, you know, what's gonna help us is if the children are the curriculum. And I really think that if we start to, as we're leaning forward, if we look at the standards we keep looking at these, we have a bazillion academic learning standards and they are all valuable. But when we, we have only so much time, like Robert said, and we spend all this time focused on all these gazillion standards, and you can even lose track of what you're teaching and who's learned what and where you go, our pandemic showed us, why don't we cut back those standards and prioritize what we really want kids to know? And then we teach them in a variety of ways and we let them really dive in and learn how to learn them and learn how to show what they know. And then we spend a lot of time in social emotional learning where children learn how to talk about their own experience and share with each other. And that's how we'll build community and we'll learn about each other and we'll start to build empathy and we'll start to be able to teach. Uh, which one of you said in Washington, we have amazing curriculum? It was Robert. We have amazing materials that we can use um, for all kinds of um, uh, ethnic studies or like multi-ethnic studies, whatever. I'm, now I'm losing track of what he said, but we have a lot of resources and our school districts need to become resources for what's really relevant in our communities. Um, the stories of our communities and teaching our children their voices and their stories matter, their heritage matters, that we see that. And the more we hear from our students who they are, what's important to them and their wells of knowledge, what they bring to the classroom, I think prioritizing student voice in our classrooms and um, really prioritizing which standards we wanna be teaching and being okay with getting rid of some of the standardized assessments that's really just giving us boiling our children down to numbers that we know they are more than. Um, I think that's how we're going to start to move the dial on the way we do school when we fully see our students and allow them to know that that's important to us. Yeah, thank you so much, Brooke. Uh, so I think uh, social emotional learning is key. And I think even making sure that as we teach social emotional learning that it's with an anti-racist lens, because I think we have to really make sure that um, sometimes social emotional learning, this focus uh, can actually inflict more harm and trauma. And so really understanding um, that helping students uh, understand uh, the components of social emotional learning, but with that anti-racist lens. And I also think um, we really just need to be aware of like teachers have survived uh, during this time as well. And so um, there's been a really big emphasis on students and families as it should be, but also recognizing our own proximity to the trauma of going through the pandemic. And I don't know about anybody else, but I went to the spring fair last weekend and I like drove through and the first instance was, was like, there's so many people here. And it was like, I, my body had this response because I've been away from people for so long. And and so I think it's like riding a bike for our kids in that when we return to school, we can't jump right into content. We can't jump right into assessing what they can produce, harvesting sort of their knowledge. I think we really have to pause and, and we should be spending time um, getting to know them, checking in on their, their, mo their mental health, their emotional health, uh, allowing time for relationships to develop. It's very different from talking to a, a screen with a name on it versus having the person in front of you. And so how do you develop relationships intentionally, daily, and over time? And so I think it's about, um, yes, validating their funds of knowledge. It's about having anti-racist SEL but it's also about really engaging uh, with the people in front of us. Adrian Marie Brown wrote Emergent Strategy and um, talks about less planning, more presence. And so how can we really have more presence? How can we be more present with ourselves? How can we be more present with our loved ones? How can we be more present 
with our students because they deserve it. And the best way that we can learn uh, from one another and that we can teach is through our example. It's not what we're just sharing. It's about how we are living. And so how are we embodying the things that we're trying to teach our students? And the last thing I'll say is yes, empathy and compassion are really necessary stepping stones to solidarity. And so um, I used to think teaching ethnic studies was all about empathy and compassion. And so first that learning of self and that connection to your own identity and place and space and, and our ancestors and then and the notion of empathy and compassion so we can connect to one another, but really it's because the end goal is solidarity. How can I be invested in the success of you, even if the, the consequences don't impact me? And that's what we have to really do and, and really help our students and our colleagues, all of us really understand how are we going to win or lose together? I choose winning, let's do that. Amen to that. All right, next question is about graduation rates. How will your reimagination of this artwork called teaching cut down on the dropout rate of students of color this next coming year and in the years to come? <laughs> I, this, I'm sorry. Like, um, I, I don't mean to like, la I'm not making light of the question. I think this question is so important. Um, but I'm laughing because I'm thinking about our whole conversation previously about reimagining schools and how one of the main reasons that we see differences in, in graduation rates between white students and, and students of color is that schools don't serve a large portion of our kids, even if we want it to. Like we're, it's like we have a box and we're stuffing all the kids in the box instead of shifting the box for the variety of different kids that we have. Um, and so the really the only way that we can um, increase graduation rates is not by moving reading even further back to five years old or by creating um, lockstep standards to make sure we're getting from point A to point B to point C or um, saying, hey, we're gonna teach you this in first grade, this in second grade, this in third grade, because the expectation is all kids are gonna get to hear. That's not how we do it, even though that's how we always do it. The way that we do it is by shifting what we're teaching and how we're teaching. And really, you know, thinking about the last question about, um, you know, having student voice and, and, and the amazing answers from Amy and Brooke, <laughs> like that's how we do it. It's not about a test or about our standards or about scripted curriculum. It's about ensuring kids see themselves in their classroom. It's about seeing an educator and experience an educator, number one, that looks like them. Um, and number two, that really shows a vested interest in who they are and that they matter. Um, and so building those relationships and, 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 and ensuring that the environment around them represents their own culture and their own family. And so we want there to be such simple answers to these things, but it, the answers are all human and human is the most difficult thing. Robert, Amy, Brooke, is there anything you'd like to add? Can I just add one more thing? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. I would say just one of the things that I've learned is in this pandemic, we need each other. And when we have so much rigidity around schooling and standards, I have four kids, they all learn so differently and they're all smart in their own unique and beautiful way. And so I think we really need to shift this focus from assessing, from what our kids can produce and instead really focus on learning. Like that question of like, how can we cut down on the dropout rates? I'm like, teach some, like teach in a way that kids wanna come teach in a way that kids are like, I'm excited to be here. Y'all, we're putting in restorative justice center at our school and kids showed up yesterday just to learn. They aren't getting credit. They aren't getting paid. They aren't getting anything. I, we are going to send them something in the mail to thank them for being there. But we, want, we need to spend that time to invest in our kids and have fun. Teach them something that's relative to their life. Provide an opportunity for you to learn from them, demonstrate humility, be the facilitator of learning and, and show up like, I, 
I'm like, I get paid to hang out with our future and just listen. Like when we sit at the feet of our students and allow them to share and allow an opportunity to learn from them, we all grow. And so I think that's something that we need to continue to do. Mm, amen. Wow. Amy, was there something you wanted to tack on there? I don't know how I could ever add. That is exactly it. Um, I want to loop it back to a conversation I had with the family yesterday. And I think this just, for me, brings all of it home that um, their student is moving up to middle school. And maybe, you know, this is a conversation. And the conversation actually was around retention. We've had a hard year. We, you know, learning was in different ways. School looked different. Success looked different. And Robert, you know, he was saying, um, we got to have growth mindsets, talk about where we're going and what we learned and celebrate all of that. And I had this family say, yeah, I'm not sure he's ready. I'm not sure he's all the things that he has to be to be a middle schooler. And it just like my apology to them was, I'm sorry that we ever told you that there was only one thing that was acceptable to be a middle schooler because your kid is fine just the way they are. And we as a system have an obligation to meet them where they are and carry them forward from there. And, and we can, but how do we start messaging to families and to ourselves that your kid is okay just where they're at and we will keep going and, and we will pick up help. We're gonna be here to help them pick up the pieces. That's how I want to make sure we come every day to school where whatever system you're in now, whatever form you're in now and moving forward, um, you're enough. Teachers, you're enough. Parents, you're enough. Community, you're enough. And, and we need to see that in each other. So, yeah. Wow. Well, thank you, Brooke, Amy, Robert, Mandy, Camille, Nate, and Lion. And thanks to all of you for participating and submitting questions. If your question was not answered and there were a few that weren't, uh, teachers, can, is it okay if uh, people contact you through Twitter? Okay, great. And Brooke, I'll get your Twitter handle. And actually, why don't, why don't you say what that is? Just because I don't think I know it. You want me to put it in the chat? Yeah, that would be awesome. It's, it's at bbrown253. Come follow me. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And so I'll also include those uh, Twitter account handles in the follow up email, which you'll be getting in about 24 hours. And uh, standby, I'll be sending uh, or, or I'll be playing Camille's uh, comments to how she'd reimagine education in just a minute. But I just wanted to say, since I'm sure some of you have to go, our next webinar is on Thursday, next Thursday, the 22nd. We've assembled another statewide panel of Latino thought leaders, community leaders, and educators to share their perspectives on which investments need to be made and what the COVID recovery process should look like, what we need to see as we head back to in-person learning, and what we're looking forward to that we've missed during the pandemic. This webinar will be in Spanish with English interpretation available. The registration information is on our website, educationvoters.org. Just click on events, then lunchtime webinar. I will also include the information in the follow-up email. Thank you to each of you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, please send them to me at eric, A-R-I-K, at educationvoters.org. A recording of today's presentation will be available on our website, educationvoters.org, and will be sent to you in the follow-up email please feel free to share the recording with your friends and colleagues. If you would like to learn more about League of Education Voters or support our work, please visit our website, educationvoters.org. Thank you again for attending. Each one of us has the right to feel safe and valued. Together, we will fight for a world in which true educational and economic equity exists. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Brooke, Amy, Robert, Mandy, Nate and Lion, thank you so much for joining us and for all you do. And on that note, I'm going to show Camille's comments on how she would redesign education. We're spending so much of our time right now talking about that in our different circles in our district and actually the, the interviews that I'm facilitating at this moment with our staff, family and students are around these questions. What do you want to keep that we've started? What's been the best parts of this situation that we've been in? What do you want to recall from that we've kind of lost and bring back? Or what do you want to quit that we're doing right now that we never want to do again? Um, and 
or just building out a lot of the information. And for myself, you know, this has probably been one of the biggest growing years I've ever had professionally, um, just with my new role and um, all the different opportunities that that role has brought in the midst of the pandemic and everything, you know, from um, I'm also going through my admin internship. I'm just finishing that up in the next couple of weeks. And so I'm <laughs> shifting that perspective in the midst of all this has been a crazy kind of opportunity too. Um, but the thing that throughout all of it, the thread that runs through all of it really for me has been family engagement and um, collaboration with families and thinking of families in a different way from even kind of beyond family engagement, that it's not just about how do I get the communication out to families? How do I hear from them? And that two-way communication, it's more, how do I really listen deeply to the priorities that they have and value the knowledge and experience and, and values that they hold for their students as an integral part, an, an integral part of a decision-making process. And, and that without that perspective, I'm not going to be able to make the best decision or take the best next step. And so starting to learn about how to really engage families authentically and listen to them as leaders um, and um, think about that in a whole new way. That's really been a lot of my learning this year and what I hope to continue learning and also build into the systems that I get to be involved with working in over the, the next few years. And, you know, as I kind of shift into this administrative kind of path in my career as well. Thank you for all you bring to the world. I really appreciate you being part of this. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I just can't say that enough. And I look forward to uh, getting us all together, hopefully right before the 2021-22 school year gets going because teachers, you have so much to bring, uh, so much wisdom to share. And uh, I just feel so honored and blessed to have you uh, in this discussion with us. Hope you have a great rest of your week.